All right, everyone, it's a blessing to be here. This is my first time visiting St. Mary and St. Athanasius here in Mississauga, so it's a, it's a big blessing and honor to be here among all of you. I always hear wonderful things coming out of this church. It's a, it's a church that, that, that shines light throughout the whole world. May God continue to bless your ministry and the ministry of the fathers here serving among you. First, I want to say, what wonderful weather here we have in April. <laughs> Happy Easter today. And specifically, the suffering of Christ, but I'm not going to teach you anything new about the suffering of Christ. But it's really important that each and every one of us decides, what is my view of suffering? The more our minds become unfortunate like the world, we're always going to see suffering in a very, very dark light. Suffering... You know, to any one of us, when you think about suffering, it just sounds this very dark, scary, unpleasant thing. But when you think about what it is that you'll find in suffering, you'll desire. Each and every one of us, I hope, will, will desire. How do I click? Yeah. So I was reading the saying of a... Of a of an Orthodox ascetic, his name is Saint Siloan the Athenite. And he says, the measuring stick of one's love for God is by how much they suffer. The measuring stick of one's love for God is by how much you suffer. And so, you might think, I don't love God, I don't plan on loving God because I don't want to have suffering. I'm happy the way I am, but Isaac the Syrian says something very, very nice. He says, it is not possible for any man to draw near to Christ without tribulation and without afflictions. His righteousness cannot be preserved. Without suffering, your righteousness cannot be preserved. St. Paul says something, I want you to look at it and tell me what's the key word in this verse. Acts chapter 14 verse 22 says, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. When you look at this verse, what is the key word that you see in, in it? Must. Must. He doesn't say we may. He doesn't say it's possible. He says we must through some tribulations. Is that what it says? Many. St. Paul, by the way, was addicted to suffering. Anybody who's reading the Bible as a non-believer would say, St. Paul is a crazy man. Okay? There's one story, you read Acts chapter 14. He was preaching to the people, and the people were like listening to him and excited and began to start to believe. And then the Jews came, and they were concerned that the people were going to start following the teachings of St. Paul. So they gathered everybody against St. Paul, they all picked up stones and they began to stone him. So they stoned him till he became almost dead and they dragged him to the outskirts of the city. And then St. Paul's disciples gathered around him and they thought he was half dead. And they began to care for him and whatever. St. Paul, after a very short time, wiped off his galabea, went right back into the city and went to go preach the gospel because he was driven by suffering. What was it that would cause a man who was just almost stoned to death that you have the rest of the world? Okay? Why wouldn't you consider this a sign from God not to go there? But St. Paul had in his mind, uh-uh. This is where I'm going to find Christ. There is no spiritual progress that anyone can have without suffering. We're going to talk about what suffering is and how to view it. So, is this verse telling us that God wants us to suffer? What do you guys think? Does God want you to suffer? He wants us to suffer. Like, when you start to feel pain, He's like, yeah, that's great. Good for you. I want you to feel even more. Like, I want you to be down for the count. I want you to feel this misery. Is that what God wants? What God wants is He doesn't want you to suffer, but He wants you to be like Him. You see, the whole goal of the Orthodox life, 
of the life in the church is that day by day, His image would be restored in you and that God would be able to see Himself in you. 1 Peter chapter 2. It says, For this is commendable and because of conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow His steps. You see, the example of the life of Christ, to follow in the steps of Christ, is to follow in the way of suffering. And it's unavoidable. It's unavoidable for any of us. To possibly walk in the way of Christ and still feel that I shouldn't suffer. I want us to look at the sufferings of Christ. We're going to get to read a few passages. But I want to focus on Philippians 2. It's a golden chapter. What's Philippians 2 about? Bible trivia. Philippians 2. Servants. Anything from Philippians 2. Joy, because you know that Philippians is about joy. Yeah. Philippians 2 is not exactly about joy. A little bit. Have this joy by being like mine. Very good. What else? Philippians 2. A very, very golden chapter in the Bible. We're going to see what St. Paul is telling us about the person of Christ and his sufferings. And when you think of sufferings, I don't want you to think about the complete physical pain that Jesus went through. But I want you to understand something that the fathers like to talk about. It says in Philippians 2, 5 to 8. It says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Every one of us, I would hope, wants to be a disciple of Christ. You know the word disciple in Greek is emathetis. What does it mean? What is the actual meaning of emathetis, to be a disciple? You guys know? What it means is that not just to be a student, but a student that wants to become like his teacher. It's one thing to say, I'm going to sit, I'm going to listen to a bunch of teaching and take notes and smile and know all the teaching in my mind. But to be a real disciple is to become like the teacher. And so when you look at the model of Christ, it says each and every, I think this is a servant spiritual day, so you're servants. Before he became a servant, he did what? Before, in this verse, before Jesus became a servant, what did he do? Can you guys look at the screen? He what? He made himself of no reputation. The original Greek is he emptied himself. He emptied himself. What I want to focus today to understand the sufferings of Christ and the sufferings of the servant is this concept of kenosis. Kenosis is a concept that is talked about by the fathers, which is a, a concept called self-emptying. And the expression of God's mysterious love unto the end. It's emptying Himself. From the day that the Lord was born, He emptied Himself. He emptied Himself. He was born in a manger. Day one, it's already on a, on a very bad note, okay? And then he goes, and he begins to, he's rejected by his own family. And we know the difficulties in his, in his ministry. And we know the, the struggles that he had with the Pharisees, and the teachers in the temple, and the scribes, and how he was treated. Yeah, he had followings. And then he had people that were his best friends in the whole world who left him. When you look at the life of Christ, 
all you see from day one to the last day is what? The emptying of himself. If you were to measure the emptying of oneself, it wouldn't compare to how much Christ emptied when he came to the earth. I want you to just imagine Jesus sitting on his throne, okay, sitting on his throne, and he decides, God the Father decides he's going to send his only son into the world. Many of you guys have heard of Abuna Lazarus, I'm Tony, from St. Anthony's Monastery. I had the blessing of living with him in Tanzania. And when we got there, he says, I'm going to take your group and we're going to go visit a leper colony. We're going to go visit leprous people and uh, we'll go serve them. And I was the leader of the group at the time. He said, are you guys ready to go? I said, like, I don't know how I'm going to go back and tell, like, some of these parents saw their kid caught leprosy when we were on a mission in Africa. So I'm like, I'll go. We'll leave the group. He says, you guys are missionaries. He's very offended. He says, if you want to come, come, I'm leaving tomorrow. So I went and told the group, all right, guys, there's a leper colony that we can go and serve. And everybody was like, okay, and do what with it? We're going to go. When I went there, Buddha Lazarus gets out of the car and he begins to hug the people. And all of their, like, their limbs and their fingers and their toes, they're all gone. And he's taking the people's hands and he's kissing them. Many of them have open sores and hard to look at. And you see him take the hands of people and kiss them. And for the first time, I understood what it meant to see what real self-emptying is. It's the most moving thing to see, even just to our limited human perspective, what it means for somebody to empty themselves. John chapter 13, it says this, Jesus knew that the Father has put all things under His power, and that He had come from God and was returning to God. So He got up from the meal, took off His outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around His waist. Does that verse make sense? Can you guys look at the verse and focus on it for a second? It says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under His power. I want you to imagine, I came to your church today, and Abun Angel says, okay, I put all the decisions for the next 24 hours in your power. You'd never be able to talk to me, okay? I'd be sitting up here, I'd have a gate protecting me from you, and I would, you know, have, I would abuse my authority possible. But I want you to imagine that the Lord was given all power of who? God the Father. He does what? It says, when he understood that he had all the power of the Father entrusted to himself, what did he do? He got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. The first step in becoming a servant and to become a servant like Christ is the washing of others' feet. The washing of others' feet, nowadays, like we understand it, especially the way we do it, like in our sacramental prayer that you're going to see in a couple weeks, eh, it's a little cross and you come up and it's nice and easy. When I was living in, uh, I was living in, in Africa for some time, and we received a group of Ethiopians into our monastery. And they came, and they came, and I was giving them a tour, and I gave them a talk, and it was a nice time. And they said, please, brother, you have to let us wash your feet. And I'm like, you're not touching my feet. And they're like, no, no, it's a custom. You'd offend all of us if you don't let us wash your feet. So I figured, I know a good way to switch it on. I said, okay, fine, if you wash my feet, then I have to wash all of your feet. I'm thinking the people are going to say, no, 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 no. That would be like... Inappropriate, right? We're not gonna, like, no way. You're hosting us here. And they're like, okay, deal. <laughs> that is great. Okay, so then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, they wash my feet. They're done in 30 seconds. There's about 65 people in this room. One person comes, and the way they wash my feet is they wash my feet. In and out of the toes. I mean, they, they wash my feet. Okay? And then, first person comes. I wash my whole heart. Second person comes, whole heart. Third person comes, 
I see just a line out the whole monastery. There's a line of people, like, they're like standing in the sand, and they're like rubbing their feet in the sand. I'm thinking, this is going to be terrible. And I understood what it meant to get down. And no matter what status I have, no matter who I am, the real model of Jesus is getting at somebody's feet is getting to the dirtiest part of somebody and to decide that I am going to be part of the cleansing of someone else. Each and every one of us as servants, especially sometimes as priests, this, this dress fools us. We think that sometimes the people, it seems as though the people are washing the feet of the priest, right? All these things. <laughs> but if you see what's going on, it's the opposite. I remember when I was being ordained, one of the bishops was giving me advice and he says, remember, you're serving the children of the king of kings. Like, I don't want you to think that you're something now. No, it's the opposite. You have to wash the feet of the children of the king of kings. You have to humble yourself. You have to, like, step down from your honor. You have to get dirty. You have to be willing to suffer shame. How many of us understand really what it means to wash someone's feet? Because Jesus tells us in, in the Gospel of John, it says, having loved his own, he loved them to the very end. Yeah, he loved them the greatest. And then what did he do? He washed the feet. He went down and he humbled himself and he brought himself shame. You see, it's one thing to say, if shame comes to me, maybe I can avoid it. Recently, a, a young a high school girl came to me and she said they were interviewing people, interviewing people in, uh, in their schools and asking young people, what do you think about, because in the U.S. they just passed, you know, about gay marriage in in. in in the States. She said, tell me what your thoughts are about gay marriage. What do you believe about it? And so she said, I pass. I, I choose not to speak. She came to me. She said, Abuna, did I do something wrong? I said, no, you didn't do anything wrong. But you were given a chance to be a martyr. You were given a chance and opportunity to be a living martyr. Chances are, most of us, or all of us, hopefully all of us, won't suffer martyrdom where you know, your head will get cut off. But today, present day martyrdom is being willing to wash the feet in a way that is shameful of others. Loving the unlovable. Giving your whole being to the unlovable. Because that's exactly what it means to wash the feet. <clears throat> when you think about what the Lord asked Hosea the prophet, what did he tell him? What was the challenge for Hosea the prophet? He had to marry a harlot and why? It's supposed to resemble something? Huh? He had to marry a harlot because? To do what? Here. To model God. To model, to model God. God, exactly. God is saying, I want you to know what it's like to be married to a harlot. Because my, my virgin betrothed bride is living like a harlot. Could you imagine Hosea saying, you're asking me to do what? But that was the Lord. You see, the suffering of the Lord isn't just in the physical part of it. It's even in the emotional rejection. I always tell people, you know, young people that get in relationships, I say, look, physical pain is much easier than emotional pain. If somebody breaks your heart at a very young age, that lasts forever. I can punch you in the face and you feel bad. When the Lord came before the Father, and the Lord Jesus came before the Father, He says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. You see, many of us, you'll suffer through the act of obedience. How many of you say, think it's easy to be a Christian today, 2016, in Mississauga County? Easy thing to do. 
It's a very difficult thing to do. And to obey the commandments is extremely hard to obey all that is on the heart of God. I was reading, I love, I love to read the stories of missionaries. I was reading a book called Secret Believers. And it was about people who send missionaries to the Middle East, and I believe that this book is actually talking about sending missionaries to Egypt. And they go there, and they start, one by one, preaching to people in Egypt. Non-Christians. One by one. And all of a sudden, they start finding like terrible things were happening. They came and they, they, they ransacked their houses. They went in, they turned everything upside down. People found out these people were preaching to non-Christians. Threats were being made on their family. And then the missionary said, like, okay, maybe it's time for us to go. We can't continue in the service anymore. Let's go right now. Let's just leave. We did our part. We've, we've served 10, 15 people. They came to Christ. Glory be to God. Let's leave. They said, no. If every time a missionary is going to leave the country because their lives are at risk, then the gospel will never be preached. So they said, we're going to stay here no matter what. And their wives said, okay, we understand the cost and the risk that it will cause for each and every one of us and our children. It's a perfect obedience. No matter what, you see that the Lord comes before the Father and He says, no matter what, I will be obedient to this mission. You see, for each and every one of us as servants, if you're going to have a perfect obedience, it has to be faithful unto death. You have to be obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. How far does your obedience to God go? What if God has a special calling for you? Do you realize that God has a special calling for every single one of you? A lot of people, they feel like, but I'm not, like, maybe I can't be a priest, or I can't be a missionary, I can't be a monk, I can't be a this, I can't be a that. So everybody says, I'm going to what? Play it safe. You know how many people God calls us to be obedient every day to a calling? In your place of work, in your vocation, where you are, that God is calling you to be obedient to Him and all that He asks of you, no matter the cost. How far does your obedience go? You ever have like, I began to think sometimes with my kids, you know, I tell them, all right kids, come in from playing. They say, okay daddy, five more minutes. Okay, five more minutes comes. All right kids, come in from playing. No, we don't want to come in. Kids, you're going to come in. No daddy, we don't want to come in. Okay kids, three, two, one, half, a quarter, a tenth. Like I don't, like they don't want to obey me. And I feel like, if this kid is obeying, I'm going to kill him. Okay? He should get, he has to come inside the house right now. I began to think, my child doesn't want to obey me. And look at how I feel. How much God wants to accomplish in His children. And our obedience only goes this far. You know how far our obedience goes? It goes to the point where we have this like, play it safe Christianity. Sure, Lord, as long as it's within this circle, that's perfect. I'll obey you then. You see, as soon as you step outside the circle, that's where the suffering begins. You see, it's not just suffering of, like I said, of physical pain and bleeding and martyrdom. It's not like that. But the obedience to the death of yourself. No matter how hard this temptation is, I obey if God calls me to a difficult calling. Think about Jeremiah. Easy calling or tough calling? You guys know who Jeremiah is? New Testament? Look after Revelation? <laughs> Where is Jeremiah? Where Jeremiah is the Old Testament, right? Jeremiah is somebody that had a tough calling. And every time, you know, Jeremiah used to say, like, take me. Like, I want to go, I'm done, take me. But he kept on going. He kept on going. He was obedient unto death. 
You see, he never fled from his calling. The Lord never fled from his calling. And that is the model of the suffering servant. What is your calling? What is your calling in your ministry? Is your calling in your ministry to give a Sunday school lesson? Is your calling to visit a kid? Or to... What is your calling? Your calling is to be like Christ. And each and every one of us, a lot of people say, Abuna, I wonder if I should be consecrated or not. Abuna, I want to be consecrated for God. Let me know if it's a good choice or not. I said, who said you're not consecrated? How many of us are consecrated? Raise your hand if you're consecrated. You're consecrated for the Lord. You are very spiritual people. When you guys were 40 or 80 days old, you were consecrated, you were sealed by the Holy Mayroon, and you were purchased at a price. You became not your own. St. Paul says, I consider my life not dear to myself. I am not my own. I was purchased at a price. So for each and every one of us to say, well, I don't know if I'm consecrated. If you're not consecrated, you're not Christian. If you aren't fully God, if you're not fully given over to yourself as a vessel of Christ, you're not a believer. That's the calling of each and every one of us. <laughs> that we would be, have this perfect obedience unto death. There's another missionary movie that I was watching, it was called The Mission. And it was people that went, it was these two uh, Catholic monks who went to, or priests who went to go and serve in this uh, jungle area where these people they're you know they're cannibals and they're they're very like aggressive people and they have to climb a mountain. I remember the scene never goes out of my sight. The first monk he goes, he's climbing up a rope and he's climbing up the mountain and all of a sudden he goes up there and he's supposed to let the next monk let him know when he's supposed to come. He doesn't hear the like sounding call like okay come up here like ready to go. Is it safe to come? He's waiting Two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes. Everything okay up there? He's waiting to find out like he's gonna go and climb the mountain after him. And after he looks down the river, he sees that his brother, the monk, was tied to a tree, crucified to a tree, and killed, and sent down the river. The most touching thing is that he begins to start climbing the mountain. Shmonk. Like you just saw your brother, what happened to him? He's killed. And say, okay, now I am a priest and that's my calling. No. If we ever get to that point, you've lost sight of what God wants you in your life. The suffering of Christ. The next thing is that in the Garden of Gethsemane, He carried the whole world in Himself before the Father. The next thing as a suffering servant is the person that comes and carries all that you love before the Father. You carry the problems of those that you serve, the problems of your family. You say, their problem is my problem. St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, let there be no schism in the body. He says that each and every one of us shares the sufferings of the whole church. That you yourself, my sufferings have now become your sufferings. And your sufferings have become what? My sufferings. And so when the Lord Jesus saw the sufferings of the people, of the whole world, He carried those sufferings before the Father in tears to the point where He sweat blood. Not because Jesus was afraid of the pain. It's not that Jesus was afraid of the pain. It's because Jesus carried the sufferings and the burdens of every one of His children before the Father. He emptied himself. How many of you are carrying, carrying the sufferings of those that you serve in your heart, in your prayers, in your prostrations? That you're doing prostrations all night for the sake of the salvation of a soul. Why? Because you cannot tolerate to see that one soul would perish. That is the suffering servant that we see in the Lord Jesus. And it should be the suffering servant that each and every one of us models. How much do you put 
the, the lives and the souls of those that you serve in your heart. And I just give us a lesson. I go and have to yell at kids for about half an hour and I leave. Even if it means that you have to deal for one hour with the most obnoxious children on the planet. Carry them in your heart. And carry them before the Father and say, Lord, the most obnoxious children on the planet. Just like I am the most obnoxious, your most obnoxious child on the planet. And you stood before the Father, Lord Jesus, and you sweat tears of blood for such an obnoxious servant. So I will do the same with those that I serve. There was a story of a Chinese missionary who was out, and you know it's illegal to, to preach the gospel in China and to even carry a Bible. And there's all these like undercover police that would look for the Christians. They had all their names, and there was pictures of them hung up everywhere in the city. It was very dangerous to be a missionary. One of the missionaries went out, and he was doing like this, this meeting and, and to, to people to come to know Christ. And many people ended up believing in Christ, and at the end of the meeting, the police came in, took the missionary, and threw him in prison. And when he went to prison, he saw the most difficult, despicable people that you could see. The worst people in the whole land of China were in this prison. They put him there on purpose so that they would mess him up. That they would just give it to him and treat him poorly. So when he got to prison, he started a 75-day fast with not eating or drinking. And he said, Lord, I'm going to fast and I'm going to pray. You brought me here to this prison for the salvation of every soul in this prison. To the point where they would do the most disgusting things to this missionary. They would torture him and treat him poorly and they would spit on him and the things that they would do to him in his room, like terrible stuff. And every day he would go back to his room and he would praise God. And they would say, they realized he was fasting. So they tried to force him food. And they tried to force make him eat. He would take his food and give his portion to the other prisoners. And they said, what about your portion? Aren't you going to eat? He says, no, I'm going to continue and offer this fast that you would know Jesus. And little by little, began to empty himself in fasting and prayer until the whole prison began to know Christ. That is the suffering servant. That is the suffering servant that carries his people in his heart. St. Paul. When you read the book of Acts, St. Paul basically told the Lord, I'm your man. Whatever it takes, use me. I'm going to be the guy that you can use in any situation. So God told St. Paul, are you sure? He says, yes, I promise you. So St. Paul was arrested and he was sent on a ship and he was going with a bunch of 276 other prisoners. And he's going to Rome and all of a sudden it seems as though they are about to die. And they're about to drown. They're going to go shipwreck. And St. Paul was saying, guys, like, you have to trust in me. And an angel appeared to St. Paul and said, believe me, the Lord appeared to me last night. He brought me an angel and said that we're going to be okay. The people were sending over the food. They were emptying the ship. And they were coming. I met St. Paul thinking, look, I'm going to preach to Caesar. Who cares about these 276 prisoners who are the filthiest people in the world? Let them die. God clearly going to save me. Let these people die. I'm going to go speak to Caesar. But see, St. Paul didn't have that mission. St. Paul knew that wherever he went, Lord, I'm your man. Okay, you're probably going to go through a shipwreck right now. Whatever it takes for. He goes through a shipwreck. They end up getting on the land and they bow down. They thank God that they're there. And they survive. And the people start to look to St. Paul like the man of God. Then St. Paul goes with the people and they start to warm themselves around the fire. And so St. Paul does what? He's warming himself around the fire. Do you guys remember the story? What happened? Not a snake. A cobra. The snake, the cobra went and bit the hands of St. Paul after a shipwreck. Like, is that, if that's not bad luck, if that's not suffering at its finest, and I was St. Paul and say, the shipwreck, okay, I endured the shipwreck. It was scary. It's the Hamed Nechalas. He gets to the fire, fine, they were safe. And the cobra latches onto whose hand? St. Paul's. 
You see, God, I would imagine God is thinking, okay, see, Paul, you promised me you're my man. You're my servant. First in the shipwreck, next in Spanish, sorry, just for a little bit short time, a cobra is going to bite your hand. And the people that were savages around him, barbarians, they saw this man's God must be very upset at him. And when they realized that he didn't get sick, he didn't get die, he didn't die, they started to believe. And they started to believe in St. Paul. St. Paul, that's the suffering. Is that the person that comes before God and says, Lord, I am your man. You want to put me in the shipwreck? I'll be the one that goes in the shipwreck. If you want to use me during the shipwreck, use me in the shipwreck. And when I land, if it means that a snake is going to catch only on to me, of all the other terrible prisoners with me, the snake catches on to the servant of God, I'm your man. Who today is ready to come before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm your man. I want to be the man of God. Voluntary suffering on behalf of the world. <clears throat> Father Bishoy Carmel says something. He says, To carry the cross of Christ, you must carry the cross of others. Because he says, The cross that Christ carried, whose cross was it? Was it the Lord's cross? It was our cross. The Lord carried the cross that each and every one of us meant to be crucified on. But the Lord Himself carried our cross. And so Father Bishwani Kemba says that each and every one of us, if you want to carry the cross of Christ, if you want to suffer for Christ, go carry the cross of others. Go find a single mother that can't get a break, that needs somebody just to babysit so she can just take a break. Go find somebody that is rejected in our community because we won't accept them. Because they look a certain way, or they talk a certain way, or their social status is a certain way. Go and carry their cross. You identify with them. Somebody who's been ostracized, you go and you carry their cross. Somebody who has a financial burden, go and carry their cross. Somebody who has to carry their sick husband, Day in and day out. Say, you know what, tonight I'm going to carry him from you know, the wheelchair to his bed the whole night. Just sit and watch. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Why? So you could have a break. Go carry the cross of others like the Lord Jesus did. You see, true Christ-like love identifies personally with the suffering of one's neighbor. To the point where you love the pain of your beloved. You want to take on the pain of those that you love. I'm going to end with one story about a lady named Dorothy Day. Dorothy Day is a Catholic lady who lived in uh, New York and she started to feel for all the drug addicts and homeless people and prostitutes that were in the streets of New York that it was a time it was a it was a recession and these people couldn't find jobs and she began to write a newspaper sell the newspaper and the money that she would get she would use to support these poor people until she started to see like the 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 homeless people would come and take the food from her daughter's plate and eat it and then she'd go come home and she would find that they would be sleeping in her and her daughter's bed in the house because they were living with her in her house. And she was offering more and more and more to Christ and she was saying, Lord, I'm doing this for your sake. So one time, one of the prostitutes who was on drugs began to attack her and almost tried to kill her. Dorothy Day went into the church and she saw the cross. It was a huge crucifix. And she said, you say that you are among the poor, the prisoners, the prostitutes, the drug addicts, then you are ugly, and you're smelly, and you're dirty, and you're filthy, and you're the worst person to have to deal with. But I'm going to continue to carry your cross. And she goes back into the house and offers her whole life to serve drug addicts and prostitutes and people that would never offer her the same appreciation that she's giving them. The Lord says that that's who He is. If you want to suffer like the suffering servant, empty yourself for others. Offer yourself to the point of death. 
I pray that we would understand what it means to be a suffering servant. That we would understand what it means to walk down the narrow path. The path that is difficult. It says, narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are few who find it. I hate to break it to you. The narrow path, there are few who find it. Because in our carnal minds, our worldly minds, we do everything to avoid suffering. But we heard stories of missionaries who went willingly because they couldn't imagine themselves apart from the one they love. They understood that when they suffered, they took Christ on themselves. That when they suffer, they can identify with Jesus because when Christ took sufferings into Himself, when He suffered pain, that today when I suffer pain, I can find Jesus in the pain. Anything that Christ took upon Himself, if you take it upon yourself, you'll find Christ in it. Because Christ sanctified pain. The pain now is something special, something holy, something sweet. But there's so many people. I have two, we have two young women that got breast cancer at the same time at our church. And it really like shook our, commu our community. And all the people were so upset, really like frustrated. How could God do this? They're young, they have children, they still have their whole lives ahead of them. If you ask the two people with the cancer, what's their opinion? They say, I wouldn't change it for the whole world. What I experienced in this year of suffering with, this, with the chemotherapy and the pain and all this stuff, I experienced the Lord Himself. Whenever priests, you go and you visit the sick, and there's the family, everybody's complaining, where's God? How come God is not listening? Ask the person on the bed how they're doing. Usually the person on their bed says, well, alhamdulillah, no, no, really, how are you doing? He's saying, believe me, I couldn't be happier. What do you mean? You're suffering. I'm experiencing Christ in a way that I could never have experienced it. I'm sharing in the sufferings of Christ. Here we have the model of the suffering servants. The Lord Jesus, who took the, emptied himself, took the form of a servant, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. I pray that this would be our icon. If you want to follow him, everyone is going to be shouting out the folk that he goes and all along the hand. It has bunesh, okay? If you mean it, if you mean it, this is this is this is like this is how you say your thoughts that he goes with your heart. This is how you offer your prostrations with your heart. You say, Lord, I want to go with you to the cross. I want to be with you on the cross. I myself will carry the cross of Christ. Glory be to God forever. Amen.